Hi, my name is Skyla, and I've beaten a lot of Nuzlocke's. I've completed almost every mainline Pokemon game under a hardcore Nuzlocke rule set. After about a year of Nuzlocking, I figured it was finally time to take a stab at one of those difficulty hacks you've seen all over YouTube. For my first ever ROM hack, I decided to attempt Dreano's Renegade Platinum. Renegade makes Platinum a total nightmare, giving all gym leaders full teams of six Pokemon with competitive items, adding a bunch of new required mini-bosses, and even making you battle trainers that have legendary Pokemon. The game also makes a lot of fun changes like updating learn sets to Generation 7, adding the fairy type, and changing the typing and stats of many, many Pokemon. As for my rule set, I will be playing in standard hardcore Nuzlocke rules, which in short means I only get one Pokemon per route, if a Pokemon faints, it's dead forever, no overleveling past the next gym leader's ace, and no items in battle. Additionally, I'm also playing with no grinding rule set, which just means I'll have unlimited money, rare candies, and berries, and I'm allowing myself to EV my Pokemon using PK Hex once I reach a certain point in the run. This is just to reduce time spent grinding so I can spend more time playing and having fun making these videos for you. That's about all for the rules, let's get right into the run. As the game starts, I get the chance to pick my starter. I pick Chimchar because in Renegade there's a 50% chance for him to have the Iron Fist ability, which boosts the power of all of his punching moves, and I anticipate the rivals in Polion will be easy to deal with. Turns out I was wrong, however, because I end up losing the first rival fight against our rival Hoffman. Oh well, but by my rules the run doesn't start until I receive Pokeballs so attempt one continues. As you head to Professor Rowan's lab, I name my Chimchar Tap, and I go to get the gift Pokemon in the back room. Rowan offers to give us both Piplup and Turtwig, but my rule set only allows me to keep one of them. I decide to keep Piplup and name her Jill Tuck. I now have a bunch more encounters before the gym, and I go back to the starting town to pick up the gift Eevee that my mom has for me. I name him Adam. At, then at Lake Verity, I get a Surskit, who I name Perez. And then instead of giving us a catching tutorial on Route 202, our second rival, Lucas, challenges us to a battle. We take care of his Turtwig easily. Then on Route 202, I get a Rattata, who I name Art Blank. Then already, tragedy strikes. Beaming with confidence, I'm playing carelessly, and Jill Tuck falls to a critical hit from a Burmy, of all things. A Burmy. With the tone now grim, I move on to Jubilife City, where there's a reporter who will give me a gift of the three Kanto starters if I beat her in battle. Just like the gift from before, we can only keep one of them. I choose Bulbasaur and name her Lynn Denlin. Then on Route 218, we get a Magikarp, and I name him Jeff. And on Route 204, I get a Starly, who I name Abby. And in Ravage Path, I get a Makuhita, who I name Xavier. Then, as we make it to Route 203, Hoffman challenges us to a battle. In this battle, I come to realize that my team is painfully weak, and Hoffman's lead Starly does scary amounts of damage to my entire team with Wing Attack. I come to realize that I am already going to have to make a sacrifice, and I decide Perez to be the one to take the fall. Adam is able to clean up the kill on Starly, and Wynn Denlin makes short work of the rest of Hoffman's team. On Route 203, I catch a Spiro and name her Addison. Then on Route 207, I catch a Ponyta, who I name Pamela. In Orberg Mines, I get a Zubat, who I name Bobby Dagan. And at the Orberg Gate, I get a Geodude, who I name Seth Baxter. And then finally, in Orberg City, I can go talk to Steven, who gives me a Beldum that I name Strom. After all those encounters, we're finally ready to start the first gym battle, and this battle can be very easily cheesed with any ground type. The Nose Pass Rourke leads with has a moveset of Stealth Rock, Sandstorm, Shockwave, and Thunder Wave, so he can't do any damage to Seth Baxter. This allows Seth to set up plus 6 defense with Defense Curl and plus 6 speed with Rock Polish, and then, since none of Rourke's other Pokémon know a special attacking move, this leaves Seth free to sweep the entirety of his team, and just like that, we have our first badge. 
Moving on, as we get to Flow Aroma Town, there's another reporter with a starter gift, this time with the Johto starters. I decide to pick Cyndaquil, as he has a 50% chance to have adaptability, which makes his stab attacks go from a 1.5 damage multiplier to a 2 times damage multiplier, making him an offensive nuke. I name him Gus, and he ends up having adaptability. Then I go on to the Valley Windworks, where I get an Elekid. I name him Eric Matthew. Then in the Valley Windworks, we have to fight the first of many galactic commander battles, this one against Mars. She leads with a Zubat, which is easily dispatched from a facade from Addison. Her Yanma up next meets a similar fate. Her Bronze Ore puts Gus to sleep with a Hypnosis on the Switch, which is a little annoying, but the poor little guy can only get off one extra sensory before Gus torches him with a Flame Wheel. Finally, Mars sends out her Perugly, which poses a massive threat. But by switching back and forth to utilize Jeff's Intimidate ability, we can make her much more manageable, so Tap is able to take her out with a couple of low kicks. After defeating Mars, we get another encounter, and I head to Route 205 where I get a Hoppip who I name Zep. Then in the turn of Forest, we faced our first new boss battle of Renegade Platinum. Instead of just teaming up with Cheryl in the forest, she now challenges us to a battle. But luckily, her team isn't too hard to deal with. Her lead Drifloon can't lay a finger on Adam, and she swiftly falls after a couple feint attacks. Her Makuhita falls to a single aerial ace from Addison, and her Whalemer falls to a magical leaf from Lindenlin. Her Chansey ends up being mildly annoying as she freezes Tap with an ice beam on the switch, but after stalling for a while with Soft Boil, the Chansey falls to a feint attack from Adam. Moving onwards, I get a Metatite on Route 211 that I name Steven Singh, and a guaranteed Feebas in Mount Coronet that I name Ashley. We then move on to Route 216, where I got a snow runt named Debbie. However, it is at this point where the run begins to spiral out of control. While I am making my way to Gardenia to bring her back to the gym, I run into a random trainer that has this togetic. It was from here that I make the first crucial mistake of the run. The togetic lives a flame reel from Gus with a sliver of HP and retaliates with an ancient power that kills poor Gus. This was extremely frustrating, as this trainer was easily avoidable had I been more patient. There was no reason for Gus to die here, and my chances against the Aaron fight that looms just outside of Eterna City seem grim without my powerful adaptability rat. At least I have my other fire starter- Oh? I ran into another trainer that was totally avoidable, and Tap dies to a critical hit Crush Claw from Vigoroth. Not only was this saddening to lose one of the city's greatest detectives, but this was also very tilting. I lost two of my best Pokemon to very stupid mistakes that I would have never made had I been playing with a level head. At this point, I was calling this run a dead run, and went into almost every major boss expecting to lose. Keep this tilted mindset in mind, as you can definitely see my aggravated mentality shining through in some of these next fights. Hi folks, Skyla from the future here. I would like to preface this segment with a fair warning that what you're about to watch is not for the faint of heart. You are about to see horrible depictions of Zep abuse. Things like this happen every year, and I just don't see enough people talking about it. So, if you are the faint of heart, Please skip ahead in the video, for some horrible things are about to happen to Dear Zep. If you would like to do your part in spreading awareness towards Zep abuse around the world, be sure to like the video and subscribe to Skeevil to help spread awareness today. Thank you for watching, and our prayers lie with Zep. I also happened to get tilted at probably the worst possible time I could have, as we are now entering what I like to call the Gardenia Split Boss Rush. From here we fight Gardenia, Jupiter, Mira, Lucas, and Aaron, all in quick succession, with little downtime in between. However, for the sake of time, I won't be covering all of those fights here. 
you can start to see the sloppy play shine through as I lead the Gardenia fight with Zepp, carelessly letting him go down to the lead Blossom. Addison cleans up the Blossom with Aerial Ace, and the Breloom goes down in a similar manner. After getting off a Stun Spore and a Shockwave, the Tangle of Two falls to Addison. I then overestimate Addison's bulk, and she falls to a sun-boosted Weather Ball. Bobby is then able to clean up the Cherim, and barely misses the KO with a wing attack on Gardenia's Roserade, but he lives the extra sensory in retaliation and takes care of Roserade on the next turn, leaving Gardenia only with her Grottle. The Grottle proves to be annoying, stalling out Jeff with a combination of Leech Seed and Protect, but falls to a single sludge from Lynn Denlin as she comes in. We now have two badges. Before the next battle, I head into Eterna Forest where I get a Shroomish. I also name him Steven Singh since I kinda forgot I already named someone that. I then head to Eterna City Galactic Building and take care of Jupiter easily, so we can just skip that fight. However, I do have access to a couple more encounters now. While I lost the footage of it somehow, I head to the mining guy's house where I'm given a boatload of fossils. Cynthia also comes and gives me a Togepi gift. I name the Togepi Cecil. I head back to Orberg City and revive an Aerodactyl in the museum. I name her Amanda. I can also head to Route 206 where I get a Slugma in the grass and I name her Carla. I then head to Wayward Cave where I have to fight Mira. This fight is also unremarkable. But what is remarkable is how Mira decides to kill both the Gibbles that could have been my encounter for the area because I had forgot to repel. Can't decide if that's on me or on her, but either way I would have really liked to have a Garchomp. Next I have to head to the south entrance to Mount Coronet to fight Lucas. I think I have a pretty good strategy as I can use Ashley to- oh. Yeah, Ashley dies right out front of the Lucas fight to a critical hit from a random Graveler who just decided to blow up. Oh well, back to the drawing board. In the start of the Lucas fight, his lead Piloswine hangs on against Jeff's first attack due to his held Focus Sash, but he falls soon after, but not before doing a good chunk of damage with Rock Slide first. I then send in Art Blank to fight the Grand Bull, and according to my calculations, Art should be able to one-tap the Grand Bull with a return. But alas, my calculation was wrong, and Art goes down in vain. Xavier is able to come in and clean up the kill with a fake out though. Next out for Lucas is his Grottle, which goes down to a crit poison fang from Bobby Dagan. As Licky Licky comes in, I decide to stay in with Bobby to fish for a poison from Poison Fang. I actually get it on my second attack, meaning the battle is basically won. I send Xavier back in and he finishes off the Licky Licky with a revenge, winning us the fight. Now for the part I was scared for. Before we can get into Heart Home City and challenge Fantina for the third badge, we have to fight Elite Four Aaron at the gate. He sports a team that's almost as good as his final team in regular Platinum, and we fight him while we only have two badges. Against his lead Dustox, I set up Stealth Rocks with Seth Baxter, who gets poisoned with Toxic in return. As I switch to Strom, he takes a big chunk of HP from Bug Buzz. On the next turn, Dustox barely lives a Zen Headbutt and retaliates back with a critical hit Bug Buzz that squishes poor Strom between the walls. Amanda comes in and finishes off Dustox with a Rock Slide. Out next for Aaron is Caesar. I intimidate him once with Jeff and then switch to Carla as Caesar sets up a sword stance. Carla can easily take out Caesar with a lava plume, but his iron head flinches her. I then carelessly sacrifice Amanda to an iron head for some reason. Yeah, I don't know. I genuinely can't tell you what I was thinking there, but I guess that's just how it be sometimes. Jeff comes back in and does some chip to Caesar with Aqua Tail, putting Caesar in the red and letting Bobby come in as Caesar falls to the burn on the switch. Bobby then KOs both Beautifly and Venomoth with wing attack thanks to the Stealth Rocks chip. As Drapion comes out, I switch to Jeff, but Drapion sets up a sword stance on the switch. Fearing if I switch again, Drapion will just sword stance again, putting him in position to sweep my whole team. I stay in with Jeff and pray that I can take a cross poison. 
Alas, my prayers seem to be in vain. But after Jeff's death, Carla is able to come in for free and finish off the Drapion with an Earth Power, winning us the battle. Before getting to Heart Home, I also caught a Zangoose on Route 208, which I named Morgan. I also, for some reason, don't have footage of this, but you'll see her in action in this upcoming Fantina battle. Speaking of the Fantina battle, she leads off with her Drift Limb, and I lead Morgan. I set up a sword stance as Drift Limb sets up a useless calm mind. At plus two, one Night Slash is enough to take out Drift Limb, and Gengar comes out next. After hitting a hard sludge bomb, Gengar 2 goes down to one Night Slash. Next up is Spiritomb, and I switch to Carla. After a soft shadow ball, I set up a light clay boosted light screen, then swap to Cecil. With the light screen up, Cecil is free to set up two nasty plots, then take out Spiritomb with Moon Blast. Miss Magius is up next, and thanks to light screen, a power gem misses out on the kill, and Cecil retaliates with a Moon Blast that picks up the KO. As Dusclops comes out, I switch to Carla, who then sets up Reflect for free as Dusclops goes for Protect. On the next turn, Dusclops hits a very soft Shadow Punch and Carla retaliates with a hard Lava Plume that gets the burn. The next turn goes mostly the same and Dusclops goes down. As Fantina's last Pokemon, Banette, comes out, I switch to Adam who completely walls her. After stalling for a while with healing items, Banette eventually goes down to the crunch, and we have three badges. After we get the badge from Fantino, we have a rival battle against Hoffman, but he's no challenge. We then head down to Route 212 to drive Team Galactic out of the Pokemon Manor. This is a new boss battle to Renegade Platinum where I team up with Hoffman in a multi-battle against Commander Saturn and Gentleman Backlog. As the battle starts, me and Hoffman lead Carla and Staravia, and Backlot and Saturn lead Wigglytuff and Bronzong. Hoffman and Staravia immediately dies to a Thunderbolt as I set up Light Screen. Hoffman Snorlax comes out next and immediately does nothing by going for a yawn on the Bronzong as I hit a hard flamethrower. On the next turn, Wigglytuff puts Snorlax to sleep and I make the mistake of killing Saturn's Bronzong. Saturn's Toxicroak is out next, and I switch to Lin Denlin. On the switch, Toxicroak hits a soft drain punch as Wigglytuff puts Lin to sleep with a sing. On the next turn, Hoffman's Snorlax goes down to a double up from the enemy, and Hoffman's Heracross is out next. Toxicroak hits a crit poison jab into Lin Denlin, bringing her into the red, and on the next turn, I switch to Pamela as Toxicroak takes down Heracross with a poison jab. At last for Hoffman is his print plup, and I nail Wigglytuff with a hard flare blitz. But Wigglytuff puts Pamela to sleep with a sing, as Hoffman finally does something by taking out Toxicroak with an aerial ace. As Saturn's Octillery comes out, I switch to Eric Matthew, but Hoffman's print plup goes down to the Wigglytuff, meaning he's out of Pokemon and this battle is now a 2v1. An Octillery lands a critical hit plus accuracy drop Octazooka on Eric Matthew. Eric then hits a Thunder Punch that just barely misses the KO on Octillery and goes down to a critical hit Moon Blast from Wigglytuff. Wonderful. Bobby then comes in and quickly kills the Octillery with a Wing Attack, eliminating Saturn from the battle and making this a 1v1. The Wigglytuff hits a Thunderbolt in return, but Bobby's able to tank it. Soon after, the Wigglytuff falls to a Poison Fang from Bobby, and as Raichu comes in, I send in Carla to set up Light Screen. With the support from Light Screen, Adam is then able to clean up the last two of Backlot's Pokemon. RNG was clearly not on my side for that fight, so I was just happy to walk away with only one death. On the way to Veilstone, I have a bunch more encounters to pick up. A Pikachu at the Pokemon Manor that I named Paul, a Chansey on Route 209 that I named Tracy Rig, a Misdreavus in the Lost Tower that I named Carrie, a Tauros on Route 210 that I named Trevor, a Merrill on Route 215 that I named Brit, and a Cacnea on Route 214 that I named Angelina. And finally, and most importantly, 
Now that I have Ultra Balls, I head back to the old chateau and get a Rotom. He goes by many names, but we know him as Seth Baxter. I know there already was a Seth Baxter, but the name just felt right. It is from here on that this becomes less of a story and more of a legend. A legend that follows not a man, not a beast, but a washing machine, who also sometimes happens to be a microwave. When he was but a child, Seth's entire family was brutally slain by the evil Team Galactic, as they knew life forms as powerful as Seth would surely thwart their plans to create a new world of their design. As the last living Rotom, Seth has sworn with rage and vengeance, and he became the leader of his newfound team, determined to stop Cyrus from resetting the universe and to avenge his lost family. However, it is not yet time for Seth to make his debut on the battlefield as we head on to challenge Maylene. Maylene's team may be the toughest we've had to face yet. She sports many major threats including a Machamp with a Toxic Orb and Guts, an Infernape with Life Orb, and her ace Lucario who has a Focus Sash and Adaptability. As the fight starts, Maylene leads Metacham and I lead Carrie. Carrie immediately annihilates the Metacham with a single Moon Blast, putting us up 6-5. Out next is Lucario, and I switch to Xavier. However, on the switch, Lucario gets a brutal special defense drop on Xavier with his Flash Cannon. This means I won't be able to survive another hit. I go for the Fake Out on the next turn to break the Focus Sash, but with little options left, I'm forced to let Xavier go down. I then send in Diana, but things are looking grim as the follow-up Psychic leaves Lucario in the red. Knowing Maylene will heal on the next turn, I go for another Psychic to bring Lucario to about 40%. I now have my back against the wall again, and I have to let Diana go down. I then send out Carrie, who finally finishes off the Lucario with a Shadow Ball. Out next is Toxicroak, and the scariest thing that could've possibly happened happens. Oh, it does way too much. What? What? Oh my god, I was typing in the calculator! This wrists a crit from Poison Jab from Toxicroak, and... Carry Holds, which allows her to clean up the Toxicroak. Out next is Gallade, and I switch to the first Seth Baxter. Hoping to bait a Drain Punch on the switch to Cecil, Gallade ends up going for Reflect, allowing me to lock him in with an Encore, which effectively makes him useless. I'm then able to set up three Nasty Plots on Cecil, putting me in position to sweep the rest of Maylene's team. Out next is Infernape, and this is the last scary part of the battle. If his Rock Slide manages to crit or flinch, I lose. Luckily, Cecil holds, and the battle is now practically won. Infernape goes down, and Machamp does as well in quick succession, winning me the fourth badge. On my way to Pastoria, I have a few more encounters to get. I got a trap pinch in the Maniac Tunnel and name him Will Easton. A neat arena in Valor Lakefront, which I named Simone, and an unknown in the Salacion Ruins, which I named Dejica after Dan, Evan, Jake, and Kara, the neo-Nazis from Saw 7. Then, as I'm running back through Valor Lakefront, I find this. I named this little blue fella Hank. On Route 213, I find a Swellow, who I named Brent, but we'll be calling him Roderick for the rest of his time with us. Finally, on Route 212, I catch a Grimer, and I name him Malik. Before we can challenge Wake, we have to fight Hoffman again in Pastoria City, and this is where our hero will make his debut. Hoffman leads with a Staraptor, and I lead with Seth, where he zapped his first bird of very many to come, putting us in the lead. Next out for Hoffman is Breloom, and I switch to Roderick, but unfortunately for poor Roderick, Breloom decided to go for Force Palm instead of Spore or Bullet Seed as I had planned. This means that it is already time for dear Roderick to meet his end, as this Breloom has a Focus Sash, letting him live on 1 HP and to ground our beloved bird. Thankfully, Hank can come in and clean up the Breloom, as well as the Heracross that comes out next thanks to the help of a critical hit. 
Next out is Snorlax, and I switched to the OG Seth, who can handily take Snorlax's attacks and take him out with two earthquakes. Next out is Empoleon, and it's time for the double Seth tag team to shine. Seth too comes in and swiftly takes care of the Empoleon with a Thunderbolt. Last for Hoffman is Arcanine, and I switch to Brit who after tanking one Thunderfang is able to take care of Arcanine and win the fight with an Aquatail. Now it's time to challenge Crash or Wake, and I think I have a pretty good plan. His most problematic Pokemon is a speed boost Sharpedo with a Focus Sash, but we'll be able to bypass the Sash if we use Bullet Seed on Bre- Oh. Okay. Back to the drawing board, I guess. Okay. We've made it to Wake, and we've got a new plan locked and loaded. Wake leads off with his Quagsire, and I lead Angelina. Angelina has a very special job as she sets up Spikes. She's holding a Yachi Berry, so she'll be safe even to a critical hit from the incoming Ice Punch. On the next turn, Angelina easily takes care of the Quagsire with an Energy Ball. Out next for Wake is Gyarados, and I switch to Paul. I suspect Paul will be able to easily kill Gyarados with the Thunder, even through the Wakon Berry, but it appears I was sorely mistaken and Paul goes down to an Aqua Tail. Seth Baxter is able to easily come in and clean up the Gyarados, however, even after the heal. Out next is Ludicolo, and I switch to Adam. Ludi hits a soft fake out on the switch, and after taking a nasty rain boosted Hydro Pump, Adam is able to set up Sunny Day. Then with a combination of Moonlight and Gunk Shot, Adam is able to easily 1v1 the Ludi. Poliwrath comes out next, and I switch to Lin Denlin, but instead of going for the Drain Punch I expected, Poliwrath goes for Hypnosis. Lin then proceeds to sleep for four turns in a row, and I end up having to switch to Seth again. Seth easily takes care of the Poliwrath with a single Thunderbolt. Out next is Sharpedo, and now this is where the spikes from before pay off. Sharpedo's Focus Sash is broken, and he immediately goes down to a Thunderbolt as well. Last for Wake is Plotzel, who hits a fairly hard crunch before going down to one last Thunderbolt, winning us the fifth badge. It's at this point where you can likely start to understand the sheer power that Seth Baxter wields. His undying rage and lust for vengeance against Cyrus and his evil organization have given him unmatched fury in battle. Even though Wake managed to kill one of my own, I almost feel sorry for him just because he was stupid enough to get in Seth's way. Before we can head to Canalave City for our sixth badge, it looks like Team Galactic is causing trouble again, and you can already infer that Seth is eager to stop them. We catch the grunt that set off the Galactic Bomb in the Great Marsh, and Cynthia comes to send us on a delivery errand to bring some charm to her grandma. However, our delivery girl Aaron quickly turns into a bloodbath. On the northern part of Route 210, tragedy strikes. When Denlin fails to outspeed a random Starmie and goes down to a psychic, then things get scary as they end up risking a crit on Seth Baxter on the switch and later risk a mist on a hydro pump. Then, death acts cruelly yet again as Black Belt Adam takes the lives of both Pamela and Angelina. However, the woeful tale of Northern Route 210 hasn't ended yet, as we still have a run-in with Lucas before we can deliver the old charm. Lucas leads with his Alakazam, and I lead with Tracy Rick. Tracy can easily wall the Zam, but Lucas opts to switch to his Grand Bull after a couple turns. Stealth Rocks plus Seismic Toss deal about 40% to the Grand Bull as I go off to Malik, expecting a close combat. I was wrong and Grand Bull hits a nasty earthquake that kills Dear Malik. Seth Baxter comes out next and does what he does best, KOing the Grand Bull with a Thunderbolt. Next for Lucas is Torterra, and I switch to Adam, who kinda sorta tanks a wood hammer. Using Adam's supreme bulkiness, I can set up a sunny day and stay healthy with Moonlight as the Torterra whittles himself down with wood hammer recoil. Once he's low enough, Adam is free to do a bit of damage with Crunch, and Torterra finishes himself off with Woodhammer Recoil. Zam comes back out, and I switch back to Tracy. Lucas heals with a potion, but his Alakazam is no match for the sheer defensive unit that is Tracy Rig. I switch between Adam and Tracy one last time to get rid of a special defense drop, but Zam falls on the turn Tracy re-enters the field. 
Out next is Licky Licky, and I quite literally make the exact same mistake again. And I switch poor Debbie the Glalie into a critical hit earthquake that just kills. Next out comes Brit, and I like to call this strategy, F*** it, we drum. I set up a belly drum with Brit, maxing her attack, and letting her just absolutely annihilate the rest of Lucas's team, winning us the battle. After burying five more of our friends, we finally make it to Celestic Town. There's a galactic grunt threatening to destroy the cave painting of an old legend, and Seth is raring to go. Seth makes short work of the grunt, and we move into the cave itself. As Cynthia's grandma explains the lore of the painting to us, the man himself, Cyrus, has the audacity to make an appearance. It's time. Time for Seth's revenge. Time to make Cyrus pay! He challenges us to a battle, but Seth quickly disposes of his first two Pokemon with a Thunderbolt apiece. Cyrus sends out his Weavile next, and Brit comes in to put an end to the flamboyant rodent. Last for Cyrus is Magnazone, but it's no match for Steven Singh, going down to one high jump kick. That's it! We've done it! Seth can put an end to all of this, right here! But alas, Cyrus planned ahead and he was ready to escape before we could finish the job. He was right in the palm of our hands and we let him get away. Surely we won't let something like this happen again. Before we can get into Canalave City, we need some tea to quench the guard's thirst. Luckily for us, we happen to be able to get a hot cup of tea from Pal Park. Not so luckily for us, quite the intimidating obstacle stands in our way. To get our refreshing tea, we have to defeat Castle Valet de Rock, whose team looks something like this. With devastating threats like Metagross, Empoleon, Gallade, and Alakazam, de Rock is no joke. What's most concerning is his ace, Entei, the fire-type legendary that sports devastating offensive moves like Sacred Fire and Extreme Speed. This isn't going to be an easy fight. De Rock leads Gallade and I lead Cecil. The plan here is very similar to the plan for Maylene's Gallade. Set up Nasty Plot and sweep. After just one Nasty Plot, Cecil is strong enough to easily take out the Gallade. Next up is Empoleon, and you've seen this one before too. I switch to Seth and dispose of the dumb bird with a Thunderbolt. Up next is Alakazam, and this is nothing new either. Tracy handily walls the Zam and takes it out with a series of seismic tosses. Out next is Metagross, and this demands a sacrifice. Poor Brit has to go down to ensure the safe switch into Carry, who can outspeed and finish off the Metagross. Fifth for Durak is the dreaded Entei, but the only thing more dreadful than the legendary beast is none other than our own Seth Baxter, who eliminates the dog-cat thing with one Hydro Pump. I then make the awkward misplay and throw away Billy the Puppet against the Staraptor. Oopsies! Seth Baxter is able to come back in and clean up the fight with one last Thunderbolt, winning us our tea and access to Canalave City. Before we can challenge Byron for the sixth badge, we have a couple bosses standing in our way. First up is another run-in with Hoffman. As always, he leads Staraptor and I lead Seth. As you probably expected, the stupid bird goes down to a single thunderbolt. Out next is Breloom, and here's where things get dicey again. I switch to Obby, but Breloom goes for Spore on the switch, putting Obby to sleep. I pivot to Adam on the Stone Edge, then switch to Jonas, hoping for a Force Bomb. Unfortunately, Breloom goes for Spore again. Now both my birds are asleep. I pivot to Adam again to tank another Stone Edge, then let Adam go to sleep on the Spore. I try to stay in and go for a wake up in efforts to break Breloom's Sash, but to no avail. I try again to go for the wake up, this time on Jonas, but again no luck. I send in Seth to tank the last Stone Edge, then switch back to Obby. After three turns of sleep, Obby finally wakes up and goes for a fly. This brings Breloom down to its Sash, but Obby immediately gets put back to sleep on the next turn. Now low on options, I try to keep Obby in to wake up again, but a 5 hit bullet seed with a crit mixed in spells doom for poor old Obby. And he goes down to a force bomb on the next turn. I send in Jonas to try and wake up, but to no avail. Not willing to lose another flying type, I switch to Will Easton. 
Will is able to finally clean up the Braille Room with a dragon claw. Out next is Heracross, and after tanking a nasty Megahorn that leaves Willy on 5 HP, our little bug dragon is able to take care of the Heracross. Out next is Arcanine, and I switch to Seth on an E speed. Seth then obliterates the good boy on the next turn with a Hydro Pump. Out next is Napoleon, and while Seth could easily destroy Hoffman's second dumb bird with a Thunderbolt, I'm locked into Choice Specs, which means we require a sacrifice. Poor Willy takes the hit from Surf, allowing Seth to come back in and finish the kill on Empoleon. Last for Hoffman is Snorlax, and as you may notice, my team is heavily battered. But I have an interesting strategy for this. I switch to Carry, and I use Parasong. Since this is Hoffman's last Pokemon, he can't switch out anymore, meaning all I have to do is stall Snorlax out for three turns. I hit him with a Will-O-Wisp to have his attack, as his Paris Song count falls to two. I then switch to Adam to take a Crunch, and Snorlax's count falls to one. Then for the last turn, I switch back to carry on the Body Slam, forcing Snorlax's Paris count to zero, winning me the battle. After suffering the humiliation of losing two Pokemon to Mr. Cheese Whiz, I need to go find Byron on Iron Island. Waiting for me at the entrance is Riley, who of course wants to battle and of course sports a very powerful team. However, as I had failed to notice, I had forgotten to remove Obby from my party, and as you may recall, Obby is dead, and I'm not allowed to use a dead Pokemon, so I'm effectively going into this fight 5 versus 6. This does make things problematic, as I needed to bring Golem in the 6th slot to safely deal with Riley's Salamence, which now means I'm going to need a little luck or a sacrifice to get out of this. Luckily for me, I'm able to find the luck I needed when Carrie lands a critical hit Shadow Ball on Metagross, knocking it out in one hit and more importantly, keeping Carrie's Focus Sash intact. This means that when the dreaded Salamence comes in, Carrie is able to come in, live a hit with her sash, and then one-shot the beast in return with a Moonblast. The rest of Riley's team goes down fairly easily, and we're able to win the battle. I wish I could say the rest of the Iron Island quest goes as smoothly as the Riley fight did, but that's just not what happened. I do get a Mawile here who I named Danica, but disaster strikes yet again as this random Medicham kills poor Carrie while I thought I was safe. However, we do manage to finish the rest of the quest and are able to move on to the gym. Most of the gym is fairly simple, except for the very last trainer who has a Mawile that hits like a truck, and my team just isn't equipped at all to deal with a Steel Fairy type with high attack. Here, both Tracy and Steven go down to this stupid Mawile, and I feel like now is a good time to talk about a concept called snowballing in Nuzlocke's. Snowballing basically means that as your good answers to a problem die, you then have to tackle problems with worse options, and then they die, and the cycle continues through the life. Had Gus and Tap not died all the way back in the Gardenia split, I would have had a good fire type for this point in the game, and this Mawile never would have been a problem. Anyway, Byron's a total joke, we can skip this one. Before the rematches against Saturn and Mars at the respective lakes, I have a couple of encounters to get. First I get a Tentacool that I named Corbet on Route 220, then I get a Dodrio that I named Judge on Route 221. The Saturn fight isn't much of a problem at all, and Seth's power alone allows us to prevail, so we can go ahead and skip that one. But the Mars fight doesn't go so smoothly. I find myself in this position, facing off against her Kangaskhan as I have Corbet in. I know I'm in range to die to a double edge here, but I don't exactly have a switch in that can deal with the Kanga. I'm forced to just click Specs Hydro Pump and pray, and it's not enough for the kill. Corbet goes down to the Kangaskhan, but Seth is able to come in and pick up the revenge kill. The rest of Mars' team isn't much of a problem at all, and we are able to get through the battle. 
However, before we can stop Team Galactic for good, we have to obtain our 7th badge. And before we can get the 7th badge, I have another death montage to show you. The very first trainer we run into on Route 217 has a mag mortar, and I switch to Jonas, expecting an easy kill. But of course, this guy has Thunderbolt, and poor Jonas gets shot out of the sky. In another subsequent battle, Trevor misses the range on an earthquake against a Tox Croak, and he goes down to the cross chop in retaliation. Then finally, before we are able to make it out of the snow routes, Danica just gets her ankles absolutely broken by a Blissey and goes down to Flamethrower plus Burn plus Hail Chip. However, it isn't all bad, as on Route 217 we do get a Jinx, who I name Gina, and at Acuity Lakefront a Weavile, who I name Amanda. And now the only thing that stands between us and the Galactic HQ is Candace. She leads Obama Snow, and I lead good old Seth Baxter. In his microwave form, Seth can fire off a four times effective overheat, absolutely nuking the poor Yeti. Out next for Candace is Mamoswine, and I switch to Kale. Kale absolutely eats a stone edge on the switch, and then sets up the sand. On the next turn, Kale eats an earthquake and retaliates back with a hard iron head that deals about 70%. I then take the free switch back into Seth since he's immune to Earthquake, and then proceed to blow up the Mammoth Swine as well. Next out is Walrein, and I switch off to Adam. Walrein opts to just keep going for yawns, so I decide to just do some chip damage with Adam and let him fall asleep. With the chip from Crunch, I'm free to switch back into Seth and clean up the kill with the Thunderbolt. That's three kills for Seth so far and he's about to make it four as he melts Candace's weird ice cat with an overheat. Out fifth is Frostlass, and I pivot to Adam to bait anything other than Shadow Ball. On the next turn, Gina is free to switch in and outspeed and one-shot the Frostlass with a choice spec Shadow Ball. Last for Candace is Weavile, and now it's time for my favorite segment, the Gay Furry Battle. I send out Amanda as Candace's Weavile goes for a sword stance. The enemy Weavile lives my brick break on 1 HP thanks to her sash, and unfortunately for Amanda, the aerial ace in retaliation is enough to kill. Morgan then gets domed by a critical hit crunch and dies as well. Oops. Gina is then able to come in and finish him off with the Shadow Ball, winning us the 7th badge. <laughs> with 7 badges in our hands, it's time for us to raid the Galactic HQ and finally enact our revenge against Cyrus and his evil lackeys. Fueled by nothing but hatred, Seth tears through all the grunts that stand guard at the HQ. It's not long before we find ourselves face to face with Cyrus once again. This is it. We have him cornered. There's no way he can escape this time. We'll finish this battle and end this once and for all. However, during our battle, something seems off. Cyrus doesn't even seem to be trying. All five of his Pokemon go down without any issue, but it can't be that easy. He surely has some kind of trick up his sleeve. But then, it hit me. Something Cyrus said before our battle was still bothering me. It will save me the trouble of disposing of them. That's when I realized. Cyrus has hostages. In the basement of the Galactic HQ, he was holding Oopsie, Mesper, and Azelf hostage. If we were to kill Cyrus now, his underlings would surely have the Lake Spirits killed. That's just not something we can allow to happen. The Lake Spirits are the guardians of Sinnoh. It was now that I realized that even if Seth and the others enact their revenge now, if the Lake Spirits are killed, it would all have been for nothing. Saving them comes first, because saving them means saving Sinnoh. So with a heavy heart, we let Cyrus escape and head to the basement to save the mystical Lake Spirits. 
Standing guard of the lake spirits is none other than Commander Saturn. And unlike Cyrus, he won't be so lucky as to escape should we best him in battle. Saturn leads Bronzong, and they go down to a critical hit crunch from Adam. His Toxicroak meets an even worse fate, which all but guarantees our victory. As I switch to Cecil, the poisonous frog thing goes for Fake Out, sealing his fate. One encore later, and the poor croak is now staring down Cecil at plus six special attack. Saturn's Toxicroak, Octillery, Rhyperior, Magmortar, and Alakazam all fall to one moon blast apiece, and we successfully free the lake spirits and put an end to Saturn. Before he cowardly fled his HQ, Cyrus said he was going to spear Pillar to enact his plan. The route up the mountain is heavily guarded by grunts, including one with a Toxicroak that kills poor old Cecil with a gunk shot. Another friend, killed at the hands of Team Galactic. When does the pain end for Seth? For me? For all of us? The answer is, it ends now. And the only thing standing in our way of stopping Cyrus for good is Mars and Jupiter, who stand guard at the peak of Spear Pillar. Like the honorless cowards they are, they attempt to take me on two against one. But at the very last moment, Hoffman comes to our aid, turning the battle into a 12v12 slugfest. Mars and Jupiter both lead their crobats as I lead Seth and Hoffman leads Staraptor. Seth immediately takes about a third and gets poisoned by a sludge bomb, but he swiftly retaliates by zapping Jupiter's crobat out of the sky. Hoffman also hits a nasty brave bird on Mars's crowbat, leaving her with a sliver. Jupiter sends out her gastrodon next, and I switch to Adam. Hoffman's staraptor gets confused, but is able to take out Mars's crowbat as gastrodon hits a muddy water, and Mars sends out Yonmega. On the next turn, I opt to go for a protect as staraptor goes down. Hoffman sends out Arcanine, and then proceeds to attack him to the Yonmega's detect. Adam hits a critical hit crunch on Gastrodon, and the Gastrodon's attack leaves Arcanine with a sliver. On the next turn, Arcanine instantly goes down to a Shadow Ball from Yen Mega. Up next for Hoffman is Empoleon, who is able to get rid of Gastrodon with a Grass Knot. Jupiter sends out her Tangrowth next, and I switch to Simone. Empoleon hits a nasty Ice Beam on the Tangrowth, but the Tangrowth retaliates with a hard Focus Blast back. Simone finishes Tangrowth with a Poison Tail, and Jupiter sends out Sableye next. I switch back to Adam as Empoleon hits a hard Ice Beam into Yanmega. The Yanmega retaliates with a strong Bug Buzz on Adam that leaves him in the red, but Empoleon finishes off Yanmega with an Ice Beam. Out next for Mars is Electivire. I go for a Protect as Empoleon finishes off the Sableye. Jupiter's Scun Tank comes out next, and things are looking dire. Electivire is a monster in Renegade Platinum. With high speed and an electric fighting typing, nothing on my team is equipped to handle a threat like that. I'm now forced with a tough decision. Electivire most definitely sees a kill on both Adam and Empoleon. If I gamble that he goes for the Empoleon, I could potentially get off a Moonlight, bringing Adam back to 75% HP and putting me in a fantastic position. However, if Electivire decides to go for the kill with Adam, I would most definitely lose the run. Not wanting to take the risk, I switched to Simone. My gamble ended up being incorrect, and the Electivire decided to kill the Empoleon. Hoffman sends out his Snorlax next as I go for Earthquake. The Earthquake, of course, barely misses the kill on Electivire, and also lands a critical hit on Hoffman's Snorlax. Great. An Ice Punch from Electivire finishes off Simone, marketing my first death of the battle. A Zen Headbutt from Snorlax, however, is enough to finish off the Electivire. I send in Karla as Mars sends in Kangaskhan. The Kanga immediately kills Hoffman's Snorlax with a hammer arm as I set up Reflect. Hoffman sends out his Heracross, and for some reason decides to go for a close combat on Skuntank instead of Kangaskhan turning what could have been a double kill into just a kill on the Skun Tank. As Jupiter sends out her Bronzong, Hoffman finally gets his sh** together 
as he one-shots the Kango with close combat, his hair across going down to the psychic from Bronzong. Kyla torches Mars' incoming Bronzong on the next turn, as Hoffman's Breloom gets brought to 1 HP from another psychic. Mars sends out her Perugly and immediately finishes off Hoffman with a fake out. However, Carla's flamethrower brings Jupiter's Bronzong down to 1 HP, and we clean up that kill on the next turn as Perugly misses a hypnosis. Perugly misses yet another hypnosis on the next turn, and then just kinda gives up on trying to hit one. She's unable to do any meaningful damage to Carla, and I win the multi-battle with only one death. With Mars and Jupiter dealt with, the time for justice has finally come. Cyrus has left for the Distortion World and we're hot on his tail. We descend into the alternate reality after him and Seth is raring to go. There's something strangely beautiful about this place. Wandering around an odd world where the basic laws of reality don't seem to apply is weirdly relaxing. The beauty of the shifting foliage, the gravity-defying waterfalls, it's serene and peaceful here. As you may have noticed in the overlay up top, Simone is still with us in the party, despite having died in the multi-battle on Spear Pillar. That is because you're required to have a Pokemon that can use Surf to traverse the strange landscape of the Distortion World, and I no longer have any living encounters that can learn Surf. That means we're effectively locked to only five party members for our fateful encounter with Cyrus. So in the event that the other five are killed and only Simone remains, the run is still lost. But we're not here to plan a funeral, not for any of our friends at least. After we solve the puzzles of this strange world, we finally come face to face with Cyrus for the last time. He's got more dirty tricks up his sleeve for this final battle, but so do we. He leads off our encounter with a double battle sporting none other than the gods of space and time, Dialga and Palkia. However, there was one fatal flaw to his plan for this battle. He didn't bring any backup. That means it is safe to go for a Paris song with Gina, putting the legendary gods on a mortal timer. On the first turn of their death clock, both Dialga and Palkia attack into Adam's Protect. On the second turn, I switch to Carla and our poor snail gets blasted by both a hydro pump and a flash cannon from Dialga and Palkia, as their death timers fall to one. Up next on the chopping block is Kale, who meets a similar fate at the hands of Earth Power. Now all that's left to do is bring in Seth Baxter and switch out Adam for Gina, and let the legendary beasts fall to the Paris song, leaving us with three brave soldiers, Adam, Gina, and of course, Seth Baxter, for the final battle against Cyrus. The final battle immediately starts off on the wrong foot as Cyrus's lead Crobat immediately kills poor Gina with a choice band U-turn. He switches to Houndoom as I switch to Adam. Adam misses a gunk shot and Cyrus switches to Magnazone on the next turn. I switch into Seth and torch the Magnazone with a single overheat. Out next is Gyarados and I switch back to Adam. Cyrus switches again after a couple crunches, this time into Haunch Crow. Adam just barely misses out on the kill on Haunch after a couple gunk shots, and the Haunch takes himself out with a brave bird. Seth, as the final defender of humanity, comes back in and zaps down Cyrus's Crobat, but not before taking a massive chunk from Cross Poison. He fells Cyrus's Gyarados as well, leaving him with only two Pokemon as he sends out his ace, Weavile. However, the Weavile outspeeds and lands a nasty feint attack. And I can't do anything but watch as Seth, in the last hope for humanity, dies.
Hi, thank you for sticking around to the end of the video. I really hope you enjoyed watching. And if you did enjoy, you might be interested to hear that I will be streaming all future videos live on twitch.tv slash skeevil. So if you're interested in watching Pokemon games or other games being played in ways that the developers definitely didn't intend them to be, you should stop by. There will be a link in the description, and I hope you have a great day.